right, we are back with Linda Rashke, our very special guest today. And uh, great to have you here, Linda. I know you have a lot to show us and tell our audience. So I'm really, I'm just gonna um, pass it over to you here. I'm going to just jump right in here. And uh, I am uh, just like when I uh, mentioned in my Trading Sardines book, you know, that we overcomplicate things a lot of times. And early on the first decade, uh, of my trading career, I learned how important it is to always consider three main things, and that was the sentiment readings, the monetary environment, and some momentum, uh, basically technical structure, but uh, momentum indicators. And these were the three variables that the Wall Street Elves Index uh, from the good old days, Bob Neurock's uh, Elves Index, uh, really were comprised of, and I think I mentioned the uh, success rate of that first decade of timing signals, and it was somewhere above 90% for market timing over a decade. So uh, these are sh should be primary tools for a technician to consider. Um, so right off the bat, though, I'm, I'm going to start off with some seasonals because this was stuff that I had mentioned on Twitter, and I just wanted to explain a little bit more about how you use seasonals and um, you know they should always be used as a secondary timing feature it's not necessarily the basis for a trade they should be used as confirming things or to give you confidence and uh, we had a seasonal long that started last week in the NASDAQ futures. And then on September 1st, we had a seasonal long that started uh, in the Dow and the S&Ps. And this is a free trade strategy that uh, Steve Moore, Moore Research Center, puts out. So I wanted to highlight this for you here, the yellow that you can see on these charts. He always gives you a, a free spread Trade And in this case, it was primarily long the Australian dollar against the Swiss. And then also it shows this long seasonal window in the Dow. And this is important for several reasons. A, you know, everybody tends to think of September as this horrible month. But you think you have to know about seasonals is that they're very much a statistical type of piece of data. So... For example, if I were to look back over the past 20 years and see that over this window, this trade worked 85% of the time, that's a fairly low sample size. So on a walk forward basis, it means that it's going to work out about 66% of the time. So seasonals are not a fact. They're not a given, um, but they do show the, the behavior in previous years. Second, they're not timing sensitive in that there's nothing superior about the day of entry or the day of exit. It's just that here is this window of time that should show a positive expectation. So right now for these first two weeks of um, September, we have a bias. It's a positive expectation. And Steve also provides the data for the previous years. So this is looking at the Dow um, Mini, and you can see that basically buying around the start of September here and exiting in the middle of the month yielded a profitable window. Uh, it looks like uh, 13 out of 15 years. So immediately it helps us correct this bias that we might have that September is a horrible month. And of course, the last two weeks of the month are not nearly quite as stellar. Um, so that's what we have going on right now, just potential for a seasonal bias. And with that, you still need to monitor the markets one day at a time. Seasonals may make their profit peak in the middle of the seasonal window and then give back. So it's a confirming factor and um, I, I would love to get Steve to do a, a show for you sometime on seasonals. He says he's too busy, so I have to just give my two cents worth. <laughs> so let's move on. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you, normally I don't start with the seasonals, but I felt that this was an important window that was unfolding right here. And for those of you that do follow 
a seasonal program, it's always a numbers game. So if you make 20 trades a month, expect, you know, 12 to 15 to be profitable and you can't put the emphasis on any individual one trade. But with that said, last month killed it on the seasonal portfolios and this month is off to an excellent start um, as well because you had plenty of opportunity to uh, look at buying spots uh, yesterday as well as last week um, and so forth and so forth. So we're going to look at the seasonals. Then we're going to start down with the sentiment, just some um, basic oscillator tools, momentum tools, market internals, uh, global money flows, and leadership. And lastly, market structure, because no matter what we look at, be it sentiment or seasonals or market internals, as a technician, I always have to be mindful that price is first and foremost. So all these things are secondary things that might tell us that there's an overbought or oversold condition or too much cash on the sideline, but market structure is first and foremost because that is how we define our risk and that is how we define if there's a trend or perhaps support or resistance as well as loss of momentum or increasing momentum. See, it's so simple. So moving on to sentiment, I love looking at put call ratios. And what I do is I only use the equity put call ratio. The reason being, sometimes if you look at things like the OEX put call ratio, there could be a lot of additional arbitrage that we don't know about, hedging against ETFs or portfolios or other things. Um, there's all different sorts of strategies that go on there. So to me, it's more important just to look at the pure equity put call ratio. And it's easy to see right here in the middle of August, we had a pretty significant spike up in the equity put call ratio. Normally this will give a lower reading than say, for example, uh, something that includes index data. So this is always a bit lower. And I love the way the fact with these charts, you can blow them up and see the fine detail that this actual peak actually happened about one and a half weeks ago, when of course the market did that um, big nosebleed uh, and bit of a bear trap in retrospect there. So right now you can see that we have a, if you want to call it a buy signal on the put call ratios, and we have not yet reached the lower end of the extreme. My um, theory for a lot of these market internal indicators is similar to uh, Soros law of reflexivity going from one extreme to the other extreme and we never quite stop too long in the middle of that equilibrium level. So right here we, we are on a buy end. We still got plenty of gas to go. Moving on, I will like to look at the McClellan oscillator. I actually use a 10 period simple moving average of the advanced decline line but everybody knows the McClellan oscillator. And I just wanted to give my two cents worth on using these types of breadth oscillators or for that matter, any momentum oscillator. And the first rule of thumb is I never try to analyze it when you are in this chop, chop trading range. You see, because what'll happen is you'll start to get so many wiggles and jiggles that none of it becomes too meaningful and we're not at an overbought or oversold level here. It's just doing a lot of wiggles and jiggles. So if it's a simple oscillator on a price bar chart, I'm usually mindful that we shouldn't be uh, trying to look at it as a directional bias. On the other hand, when we use the smoothing of these momentum oscillators, and in this case, you can look at the summation index, which is a much broader thing. I know that there's several ways that people use this. Uh, uh, the first is looking for the divergences in this, and you can see that's meaningful indeed. However, there's also another significant thing going on at work here. This is very long term. 
It doesn't mean it will play out. It does mean that there is some legitimate uh, case if you are a bull in that this essentially did a prolonged ABC corrective wave feeling for this year. So from this point here, we've essentially consolidated sideways as this has done an ABC down. So I don't necessarily see that as a deterioration. I see that as a corrective feature from these divergences that have now corrected. So for me, we're very neutral here. It's not overbought, oversold. Um, that's just my interpretation of that particular indicator. I do look at investors' intelligence as well as this is the AAII reading, and it's easy to see that this showed a, a big push up in the bearish levels, which we needed to see. All right. And uh, so, in general, with sentiment indicators, when you see a high level of bearish reading, that tends to reflect that people are out of the market. So if people are bullish, it reflects the fact that they are invested and they're expressing their opinions uh, being bullish. They're expressing their positions that way. And likewise, when you see extremes in the bearish sentiment, it's telling you that people are out of the market and generally there is cash on the sidelines ready to go back in. So that's my simplistic interpretation. Now, what's really interesting here, I don't have a chart up of the investors' intelligence readings, but that has not shown any increase in bearishness and has stayed pretty much at bullish levels uh, for the past six months. By that, I mean people have not shown any fear of the market, despite all these China trade tweets and um, other extraneous things. So some might interpret that as a level of complacency. Uh, on the other hand, this AAI reading tends to fluctuate a bit more than the investor's intelligence. So for shorter term timing, it might be of more value. Um, moving on, I like to look at a few market internals. Uh, somebody made note, I don't use the trend as much as I did once upon a time. The reason is, is that it very often gives distorted readings from Bank of America, which has uh, an extremely large float and is a low priced stock. So it can, it can um, skew this uh, quite a bit, but nonetheless, you can see the extreme uh, trend reading that we had. And we also had a 90% down day, if you're into monitoring those types of things. And as Walt Deemer so likely likes to point out, we then had two 80% up days, meaning that momentum had shifted back up. So you have a green light go after some of these extremes in the breadth, the uh, up down volume days, the uh, advancing declining issue days. And here the trend, of course, is the mother of ratio of all ratios, which is um, does have its own problems as well. I'll show you one of my secret timing indicators for intermediate timing, and it's my own invention, so I am proud of that. And if we look at the tick readings, this is the daily tick reading, the daily closing tick. One thing to keep in mind is that closing tick readings and the daily range of the ticks will vary from software program to software program. So for example, a trade station will give slightly different readings than the CQG, than other software providers. And the reason is ticks are not an exchange transmitted piece of data. So the data vendors actually need to compute their own. And 
The reason why the ranges or absolute readings can be different is they might have varying sizes to the database that they are computing the ticks on, which is if the stock is on an uptick or a down tick. That was a long winded explanation. Suffice to say that they will all look the same, give the same shape once we do moving averages of them or uh, some other work. And in this case, I wanted to show a 10 period moving average of the tick highs and a 10 period moving average of the tick lows. And what I have found is that when this gets stretched very wide like this, and our five period moving average of the closing tick pulls down low. That is a screaming buy signal. So you can see here, what does this mean when we have a 10 period moving average of the tick highs getting so overbought, if you wanna use that word, it's not correct, and vice versa, the downside the 10 period moving average of the tick low for the day, this is very extreme. Well, let me tell you what it means. It means that ticks are highly correlated to the market breadth. And what we see at market bottoms is a lot of volatility, unlike market tops where we get a lot of complacency and this contracts. So on the flip side of the coin, you can see right here in the middle of the chart, this big contraction in the daily range of the ticks. And lo and behold, it was a significant market top. And of course, that complacency manifested itself in numerous other ways, such as volatility indices and so forth. But this was a stellar example of a bottom made from um, these extreme uh, stretched and volatility that had a bullish bias. So we'll see how much that gives us. You can see the last time we had a significant uh, uh, you know, a widening of the ranges was right here. And likewise, right here, we had some significant widening of ranges. And once again, this is a cyclical thing we see with the volatility back to overshooting in one direction and then overshooting in the other direction. So this has plenty of room to narrow again um, into year end, actually. Moving on, let's look at the global money flows. I'll always start with the daily charts. And I have a grid that actually has uh, 25 markets, and I just picked uh, nine of them here because we have such a correlation now on a global money flow basis. Obviously, everybody's looking at the credit markets, and uh, I know that some traders were confused with the bonds dropping below 2% our 30-year, uh, and there's only one thing to remember, one word, and that is TINA. T-I-N-A, there is no alternative. So in other words, it was the last place that you could go for some type of yield, regardless of how our economy was chugging along. So if we look here, we can see the same type of game that we play with stocks in terms of relative strength and relative weakness. And uh, obviously the Canadian uh, uh, ETF, uh, has been one of the stronger ones, right? Unlike uh, China, which was one of the weaker ones. And the momentum, this USA Momentum ETF was probably the all-time strongest here. So in general, sometimes we can see, are there bull or bear flags? Are there wedges? Are there momentum divergences? And it just gives us a, an overall feel. Yeah, some of these are pretty oversold. They're not stellar uh, instances of a glamorous chart formation that gives you confidence to the long side. But let's jump out a little bit and look at the weekly charts. And you can still make a case on many of these. For example, Brazil. 
we're at the lower end of a channel. So we still see a pattern of lower highs, and, uh, excuse me, higher lows and higher highs. And, and nothing's really making uh, ugly, ugly lows on these weekly charts. They could just be deemed corrective environment. On the other hand, there's nothing that's necessarily knocking our socks off either. But I like to look at this grid, and when you see everything line up at once, it's like bingo. Lastly, I'll go to the ETFs where we can see where are the leadership. This is also on my grid. And just for kicks, with CQG, I can turn the inverse so we see how the driver of this whole thing has been these lucrative, easy monetary conditions crazy lucrative monetary conditions. And that has been our big driver. So then we're going to go down and we're going to look at leadership or non-leadership with some of these um, top, top stocks, the big cap stocks. And these are just all on weekly charts. And we start to see a little bit of a mixed picture in that uh, Microsoft, of course, has been really, really steady. Apple, a little bit more questionable. So we had new highs in, in many factors like this. And uh, it's, in other words, what we see is we've got, we're giving it everything we've got. The gas pedal is pressed to the metal here. We're feeding this market as much as we possibly can. So we want to see these things catch fire and, and turn back up again on the weekly charts because you know, when we take our foot off the gas pedal, what driver is going to be left after that? So these are all some background things. The seasonals, the seasonals are positive. The sentiment, the sentiment is positive. The McClellan oscillator, that's not overbought, oversold. It's not giving any screaming signals. You could make a case it's given some corrective um, movement over the last six months. Our tick reading is, is positive. Our, our trend gave a buy. It's already worked off of that buy, though, for the last two weeks. And our global environment is relatively lackluster. So we're trying to hold the rest of the world up by our bootstraps at this point. And we have a mixed bag when it comes to leadership. Now, let's get down to the coup de grace. And the coup de grace is market structure, so important. So I go by basic swing highs and swing lows because as technicians, that is how we define our trend. Are we making higher highs and higher lows? Are we, you know, are we putting in a loss of momentum or not? So what we can say big picture about our market structure with the S&P 500, because of course the small caps are a little bit different, is we are still in a clean uptrend on the weekly charts. We do not have a lower high. We only have a higher low still on the weekly charts. There is not yet any big warning sign here. And what we see with the daily chart is same thing. We are still in an uptrend of higher lows. We really would like to see this turn back up. You can see that this type of indicator is going to be dependent on the price action. So let's say at the end of the week, the S&Ps were up at 2960. You will see this little line here correct back and still be going up. Okay, so just be aware of that, that it can fluctuate. So we are still big picture in an uptrend. We do not want to see this turn into a lower high. In order for it to turn into a lower high, we would really need to come back down more or poke up and fail, what they call a classic bull trap. And we do not have that yet. And lastly, this is the 
main thing that a lot of people have um, rested their bearish case on, as Aaron pointed out, the fact that the small caps are not performing. And here was the saying that I was taught when I was a newbie on the trading floor in the 80s. And that was that the generals probe, but you need to have the army follow or else the generals can get slaughtered. All right. So what that means is that our generals are those Microsofts and the and the Facebooks and the Fangs and, you know, some of these stronger shares. But we really need to have the small caps kick in the broad market, because I don't think the leadership is sustainable for an extended period of time without lifting up um, some of these broader uh, market indices so big picture we still have an uptrend in the small caps on the weekly because we have here's our low it would be trouble if we took out that low so this is just a, a consolidation here the bulls would like to see this turn back up of course what the bulls want the market is not always so accommodating and this is the worrisome thing here in that you have this ABC down on the daily charts. And this is uh, this really needs to get a little match lit underneath it. Now, on the plus side, you did have a gorgeous little bear trap there. I like it when you see that look below and you come back into the range. When that happens, I like to look for the middle of the range as the initial target for the trade. So the small cap shares would be alongside bias on my model looking for the middle of the range. And if we can take that out, then you get the push back to the upper end of the range. And that is many steps ahead of us that we just can't go there. Now, I just wanted to take the time to show a couple more things that were of interest yesterday that I like to look at. I am very much a price-based person, so I operate off of swing highs, swing lows, and, drum roll, gaps. Okay, so we have had lots of gaps uh, at the last month, as you can uh, attest to. I am going to switch over just to some livestock charts and show some fun trades that may or may not catch fire here. First of all, yesterday when that market was selling down and when we were filling a gap to the downside, when I look at relative strength, we can look at it certain ways. We can look at it in terms of gaps. We can look at it in terms of swing highs and swing lows. And I think I'm running out of time, but I'm just going to go through this really quickly. IBM failed to close its gap. So if you like trading stocks, that is a superior buy signal when something trades into the gap and it fails to close it and it comes back up. Now, granted, it is not setting the world on fire today, but yesterday, that's what I was doing. I was putting on all the, uh, I was putting up a display of all the stocks where we traded partially into the gap but failed to fill it because those were signs of strength in my book. Facebook uh, did a similar thing. It actually failed to, to, to uh, close that by just a few ticks and it didn't close up as nicely as IBM, but you can see it's got a little bit of a fire under it right here. Now, um, this one is not setting the world on fire, Microsoft, but it is uh, the, the big cap one that I like to follow. It's, it's not going to be a high beta type of play, but it's always important for me to see that, again, it tested down and closed back up. So that was compelling. So lastly, when we look at true relative strength leaders, we're going to see a couple things. Um, Visa, I think that the financials are really important. If the, if the uh, drop in these yields has stopped going down, we'll probably consolidate sideways for a while. 
but it might give a little bit of a lift to the financials. I was hoping that would give a little bit more lift to the small cap indices like the Russell, because that actually has a significant amount of financials in it. But just check out this visa. When the market was looking kind of dicey down there uh, two weeks ago, uh, I didn't see anything so nasty about this. It looks pretty good. Same thing with the CME. Now, of course, this is in part based on a volume if we look at this. But this is just classic relative strength work. When you see the market flush down, as we did two, three weeks ago, you still saw plenty of shares making new highs. Of course, this benefits from the increase in volume. And it's sort of an esoteric, weird list of stocks because you can see there's still a play out there for anything that generates some type of yield since this is basically a utility stock. And then last but not least, we still have to go shopping somewhere, don't we? So this was one of my favorite plays when the market's a little bit soft and you get that pullback beneath that five period simple moving average after you've had a momentum spike is a superior uh, buy signal that you can hold for one, two, three, even five days, even 10 days. So that concludes my um, models that I wanted to show you today to sum up a little seasonal, sentimental, uh, market internals, global stuff, uh, where, what is the driver here? Uh, it was monetary conditions for sure. Uh, being very uh, accommodating. And then we go down to our market structure and see that the weeklies are still in a structural uptrend mm -hmm. with no lower high yet. And then we can go down to our market selection. What are we going to trade? All right. That's it. Excellent. That was absolutely fabulous. I have to say, I was pretty excited about uh, CME and uh, Southern being on your your uh, list to look at. Uh, I actually own both of those. So <laughs> there you go. I'm pretty happy with them. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's been absolutely fabulous. We are out of time. Um, but uh, your website again is lindarashke.net and go there and read the first chapter of my book because if you are a market technician, you will definitely appreciate the advanced reviews, all tongue in cheek. Yes, absolutely. I loved it. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again and hope you come back here um, another time soon. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.